Hi, it's uh, it's me, Ian Bremer, and uh, uh, I am uh, in a plane on my way to Manila uh, for the Apex Summit. Uh, but thought I'd share with you a couple of minutes just on this uh, these horrifying Paris bombings. Uh, a few things I'd say. The first, which I think really bears, you know, repeating this extraordinary resilience of the French people. Uh, this is not the first time that they've been through this. You saw the Charlie Hebdo bombings back in January. Extraordinary outpouring from every angle of French society. Uh, and an enormous backing uh, of President Hollande, who otherwise has not been a very popular president. Uh, that uh, his engagement militarily in Mali, when no other countries were willing to do very much about it. Um, the willingness of the French government to take the lead among all the European nations in fighting radical Islam uh, in the Middle East, in North Africa, uh, has been consistent and uh, is something that we'll certainly continue to see. So that, that's been a big plus uh, for, uh, for the French, and we'll see it now. But I do have to say, let's remember, when, when everybody marched in France after Charlie Hebdo, the Front National was very much excluded uh, in what was otherwise you know, sort of reaching out to all the parties. They were considered to be, and understandably, an organization that sowed hatred, uh, jingoism, xenophobia. Uh, but they have gained steadily in the polls uh, since then uh, by uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, who's uh, jettisoned the anti-Semitism uh, and, uh, and her father, um, and uh, really taking advantage of uh, the fight against Islam and against refugees uh, and, and indeed against a lot of local French citizens. Um, who uh, who don't uh, who don't seem to be French from that perspective, um, and uh, I, I have to say that you know now that the French government has been on a state of high alert and that we've had these attacks in the midst of that, uh, the ability of the Front National to pick up very dramatically their support in France is going to be high. And it's going to be very very interesting to see how Alain deals with that. It's a very dangerous situation. Uh, you know, over the course of the past years. We've really had a two-track economic Europe where we've talked about a core and a periphery, but we've thought that the politics have been pretty strong, and, and certainly Merkel has shown that. We increasingly have a two-track political Europe, and you're going to see so much more populism. Um, and uh, just like in Hungary, you've got effectively an authoritarian regime now that is won on the basis of a very nationalist uh, overture to their people. You're going to see a lot more of that across Europe in response to the terrorism and in response to a very significant and growing refugee crisis. Uh, there's no question that there's going to be a significant push now by the French and the Americans to come to some kind of uh, modus vivendi with the Russians on Syria. That does mean dealing with Assad to a greater degree, um, but uh, it also means a, a more direct and more coordinated fight against ISIS. Uh, that, that's the plus. Uh, the, the, the minus is that there's no win in Syria. Uh, there are still no rebels uh, for the Americans to work with. There weren't before the Paris bombings. There won't be now. Um, and there's a great limitation of the Americans, the French, or anyone else to actually put troops on the ground. That's true for Russia, too. I mean, they're helping Assad, as are the Iranians, but the Russians don't want to have significant casualties, and so they're going to bomb. And while I do believe that there will be a win eventually against the Islamic State uh, in uh, Iraq and Syria, because their ability to actually manage institutions, um, you know, makes them vulnerable, and they're also not very competent at it. But ISIS as an organization is going to become much stronger. And, you know, coming off of all of this, I think that the biggest issue um, is not, not only are we facing the most powerful terrorist organization the world's ever seen, and what they just pulled off in France, they're becoming more strategic outside uh, their core area of operations, their ability to recruit the amount of money they have. Um, and also how quickly they were able to attack this Russian plane in Egypt after the Russians started um, their Syria campaign. Uh, but also the extraordinary crisis in Europe. We are just not going to see a coordinated response from the Europeans. Europe today is in crisis, much greater crisis than France. Uh, the social fabric of Europe is coming apart. The Eurozone is not going to crumble. I don't think we're going to see lots of countries lead Europe. What it means to be Europe the idea of shared values that matter more um, than uh, just uh, the economic interests of creating a common market, that is going away. And so is the transatlantic relationship, which is at its weakest, the alliance, um, at any point, uh, certainly since the Soviet Union has crumbled. This is nowhere close to being a discussion that the presidential candidates are having in the U.S. right now. 
the immigration debate in America is about Mexico. It's not about Syria. It's not about dealing with Islam. So while there's no question that the Syria fight is a slippery slope for the Americans and it's going to get a little bit steeper, I think the ability to really get the Americans and Europeans together in this and the ability to get the Europeans together on anything is going away. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, a truly unfortunate time for that to be happening. So, I mean, our hearts, of course, all go out to France. And we will see over the next few days extraordinary strength and resilience on the part of the French nation. We'll see all sorts of leaders from all over the world traveling to France and outpouring of support and sentiment. But it's not what happens in the days after a bombing. That's easy. It's what happens in the weeks and the months and what kind of changes we're going to see. And here, I think the structural inadequacies of, of European governance and the lack of coordination are going to become very, very evident. And let's not forget about the Middle East, where these problems are emanating from. It's $40 oil. It's record numbers of refugees. It's illegitimate governance. Um, these things are not changing. The money's not there. There's a reason why you have millions upon millions of disenfranchised young men coming to Europe, uh, mostly Europe, uh, from these countries. Those numbers are just, just starting. So this is going to get so much worse. Um, and I wish I didn't have to say that. Uh, uh, you know, but but uh, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Um, so uh, anyway, I'll be uh, off to off to the Philippines, uh, where a lot of heads of state, including President Obama, uh, are also flying, uh, and uh, I'm sure I'll have a lot to say uh, from the APEC summit over the next few days. So interesting, though, that you know everyone in the world is converging except for the Europeans uh, and the leaders from the Middle East, which of course is where all of the problems now are oriented. Uh, so we're going to be talking a lot. Uh, uh, about uh, about the rest. Uh, anyway, that's it for me for now, and uh, I'll be taking off in a bit, buckling in. I uh, hope you all have a very pleasant weekend.